In today's video, I'd like to talk about the conversion of the Apostle Paul and what I think is the correct way to make use of the conversion of the Apostle Paul in an argument for Jesus' resurrection. And it's an interesting topic. I've mentioned it in other videos, but as far as I can tell, I've never devoted an entire discussion to this question. So I think it's important. As part of the minimal facts or core facts or enhanced minimal facts, whatever you want to call it, um, approach to arguing for the resurrection of Jesus without using the details of the gospel accounts, there's quite an emphasis upon Paul as an eyewitness of the resurrection. Usually the emphasis is placed on 1 Corinthians 15, where he says that he also saw Jesus. So he's listing the people who saw Jesus, and it's just a kind of garden variety word for saw, and lists himself as last uh, who saw it, who also is an apostle and the least of the apostles because he persecuted the church and so forth, but insists that he also saw Jesus. And so that will be used as uh, an argument that Paul is an eyewitness of the resurrection. And it's it's that wording and that concept of Paul as an eyewitness of the resurrected Jesus that I want to question here. I want to say that, yes, you can certainly argue from the conversion of Paul for the resurrection, but you should do it in a way that doesn't involve calling him an eyewitness of the resurrection in the same sense that the other disciples were. And it involves making that distinction and acknowledging a distinction there, and yet nonetheless arguing from the conversion of Paul. In the article that my husband Tim and I wrote some years ago for the Blackwell Companion to Natural Theology, we did argue from the conversion of Paul. Uh, and we gave it a Bayes factor, I just looked this up today, of 10 to the third, which is a, a hefty Bayes factor for its evidential force for the resurrection of Jesus, by which we meant the physical resurrection of Jesus. And we argued against theories like that he um, had a, you know, epileptic fit or he um, was delusional in some way because of his feelings of guilt and that kind of thing. Uh, in other words, what we argued for was that his experience on the road to Damascus was veridical. It was a, a real encounter with Jesus. But we did not argue that he was an eyewitness of the resurrected Jesus in the sense of having a physical encounter with Jesus like that, which the other disciples had. Now, in one sense, obviously, his encounter had physical aspects. There was a bright light. He was even struck blind. He said he saw Jesus. He heard and had a dialogue, so there was an auditory aspect to it. But the argument that we made there would have been just the same if this was a veridical vision as if Jesus was physically present. So what do I mean by Jesus being physically present? Well, the way I'll describe it sometimes, and I'm not trying to be snarky, but I'm trying to be clear, is that if you say Jesus was physically present to Paul in the same way that he was physically present to the other disciples, then he was floating above the road. You know, Paul actually, he, he falls down, he's struck down, and he's he's looking up and he's speaking to someone. There's this bright light. If Jesus was physically present, then the way I'll put it is, you know, if you'd thrown a rock above the Damascus road and you'd thrown it accurately, you could have hit Jesus. Or if Paul could have risen above the road, he could have gone up and he could have touched Jesus. That would be Jesus being physically present. And that would mean that Paul was an eyewitness in the sense that there were, you know, light rays bouncing off of the physical Jesus and bouncing into his eyes. Just as when the disciples saw the physical Jesus in the upper room or on the road to Emmaus or in the hills of Galilee, there were light rays bouncing off of Jesus and bouncing into their eyes. So that would be a physical presence interpretation. Nothing in our argument turned on a physical presence interpretation of Paul's encounter with Jesus there on the road. What we were arguing from instead was the abrupt nature of the transition that he had been a, a devoted persecutor of Christianity, and then he turned around very abruptly, and he said this was why. And he gave this detailed account, and then 
he was, you know, blind for three days. And then this other man, Ananias, came and uh, prayed for him and so forth. And, and then he turned around and he embraced all of that propositional content of Christianity that he had previously persecuted. Now, that's another thing, the propositional content. If Jesus really said to him, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, then what Jesus was doing was endorsing the message of the Christians who were the group that Jesus or that the Apostle Paul was persecuting. And that was the group that Jesus was endorsing. And Paul knew full well that they were teaching and preaching that this Jesus of Nazareth had, had died and then that he had physically risen from the dead. And so then that was the message that he turned around and said, I was wrong and began preaching that it was true instead of persecuting it and believing it was false. So the physical resurrection of Jesus is there. It's in that propositional content that is endorsed by a veridical experience that Paul had there. But it could have been a visionary experience similar to what Stephen experienced when he was being stoned. There are some intersubjective aspects. In one account in Acts, it says that they uh, heard the voice but didn't see any man. And then in another account, it says they did not hear the voice. This, of course, is used as a contradiction. What's generally um, said, which seems to me legitimate, is that the hearing of the voice refers to their understanding, that it was just a kind of like, you know, in the Charlie Brown, wah, 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 wah. Um, in some of the events of Jesus' life, there's a time when uh, a voice speaks to him from heaven, and some of the people in the crowds say it, it was thundering. So evidently they didn't hear articulate words either. So even though there were sound waves, you know, coming, um, and in that sense, a physical aspect to it, evidently it, it sometimes these auditory experiences are not fully intersubjectively perceptible in the way that ordinary earthly experiences are. I've seen uh, one person even try to suggest that the reason they didn't see him was because they were so struck by the light that they turned around, you know, and so then otherwise they would have actually seen Jesus there just as Paul did. But to me, that seems rather ad hoc. It seems that the visual aspect of the experience in Paul's case, he apparently actually saw like a figure or something. Um, he doesn't go into detail about what Jesus looked like, but, and mostly emphasizes the light but the, the others did not see that. And then it seems that they didn't hear, you know, the whole dialogue. Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus whom you're persecuting. And then uh, Paul gives a, a, a longer version in Acts 26 of what Jesus said to him about sending him to the Gentiles and so forth. Uh, and it's not very long, even at the longest version. So it doesn't appear to have been intersubjective in the ordinary sense just partially intersubjective at most. And I think there are even theological considerations in favor of its being visionary rather than physical. Namely that Jesus told his disciples repeatedly that he was going away and then he would return. And that return was this apocalyptic return that we think of as you know the second coming of Christ. And I'm not gonna get into uh, end times and you know, is there gonna be a rapture and that kind of thing. But I think we can all agree that that has not happened yet. And the same way the uh, angels at the time of Jesus' ascension said, he shall come again in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. And then that was something that they anticipated. So there wasn't some idea that Jesus was like physically coming up and down the stairs as it were, uh, but rather that in the ascension, he had left our space-time continuum as we would put it. And no matter how far you traveled throughout the uh ordinary physical universe that we are in, you would not reach him, he was somewhere else. And then later he was gonna come back, but that, that hadn't happened yet. So it would seem out of step with that for him to just, you know, like come back down the stairs as it were, and be literally floating above the ground on the Damascus road. Now, I do think that Paul's conversion provides evidence because I do think it's very hard to explain this in a non-veridical way. It's so sudden. This is a man who obviously has all of his uh, marbles. It's someone who knows very clearly who he is and what he stands for and what he's doing. And he's going, he's going to persecute the Christians and bam, suddenly he's, he's 
completely reversing course. He's doing a complete 180 and he's saying, this is what happened. And that has force for, and, and he still has all his marbles afterwards. You know, I mean, he's a very zealous guy. Okay. But he's not, um, he's not erratic. He doesn't seem to be insane and so forth. Um, he's not seeing pink and purple elephants. And so then he's again, this very focused person, same personality, but now just as zealous in promoting this, this very thing. And he gives a specific coherent story. I mean, yes, you can say, oh, did they hear the voice or didn't they? But I mean, generally very coherent story about what happened and what turned him around. And he gives that same story on multiple occasions that he's traveling. And suddenly there's this bright light that shines from heaven and this voice and so forth. And he's like, I was wrong. And so he, he changes his entire course of life. Uh, that's got to have argumentative weight. Does it have enough argumentative weight all by itself, though? And remember, I've talked before about not funneling everything through this one, this one conduit, okay? Again, that would take us into the question of the prior probability of the resurrection. But I would not want to argue with someone skeptical and have only the conversion of Paul and the apparent propositional content that it endorsed to go on as my only line of evidence. As I've said in other videos, if you grant, even for the sake of the argument, that the gospel accounts are embellished, then that actually calls into question the physical nature of the resurrection. Because why would they have needed to be embellished if, if the original witnesses had, you know, good stories to tell, stories that actually did support the physical resurrection. Why not put those down? So we do need, I believe, to argue that those stories represent what the eyewitnesses actually claimed. Interestingly, in a uh, recent series of video dialogues between Michael Lacona and Dale Allison. Dale Allison at one point said, we don't have any eyewitness accounts of the resurrection, which I thought was interesting in, you know, the New Testament. We don't have any eyewitness accounts. And that's because Allison, of course, believes that the gospel accounts are, are not eyewitness accounts. He, you know, he thinks that um, modern scholarship has rightly called into question the nature of those accounts and how close those really are to what the eyewitnesses claim. Dr. Lacona then smiled and he said, except for Paul. And Dr. Allison sort of accepted the correction. He didn't go into detail. He just said, oh, well, except for Paul. And he said, yeah, you know, Acts is in some ways more interesting than, than the Gospels. And he didn't go into what he, what he meant by that. And that the writings of Paul are in some ways more interesting. I believe he, if I recall correctly, he emphasized that in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul does not go into detail about his experience, which is true. He just says he saw Jesus. I, I thought it was interesting that Dr. Lacona kind of seemed willing to grant that we don't have eyewitness accounts except for Paul. And then he, he smiled at that. He seemed to think he could really get something out of that except for Paul. Now, there's something that I call the Gilbert and Sullivan effect. Gilbert and Sullivan wrote humorous um, musicals back in the early 20th century and, uh, you know, like the Pirates of Penzance, for example. And they have a song and the, the lyrics go, if everybody's somebody, then no one's anybody. Okay. If everybody's somebody, then no one's anybody. Okay. And I'll often talk about that, the Gilbert and Sullivan effect. And you get it in many different cases. You get it in modern education where all the kids get a good grade okay, or everybody gets a participation medal and so forth. The Gilbert and Sullivan effect occurs when you are trying to bring things down to the lowest common denominator because you don't want somebody to feel bad or you just want to say, you know, everybody is good here. And what that does is it eliminates information and it eliminates your ability to recognize that some actually are excellent because you don't want to refer to that because you're trying to commend everybody equally. What does that have to do with the conversion of Paul? If we try to make the conversion of Paul a paradigm of the 
eyewitness accounts of Jesus' resurrection, we will run into the Gilbert and Sullivan effect. Because the conversion of Paul, even at its most robust, even if you take all of the accounts in Acts and the epistles and you harmonize them, you put them together, you bring as much detail as you can out of them, is not as robust as the accounts in the Gospels. And let's just list some of the ways it's not as robust. The conversation is brief. Paul, uh, at the longest, it's, you know, maybe a paragraph of material that Jesus says to him and a brief back and forth. The uh, appearance of Jesus, Jesus does not do anything specific to verify that he is physical. So he doesn't invite Paul to touch him, for example. He doesn't ask if there's food. Nothing is handed from one of them to the other. The inner subjective aspects, as I've already discussed, are severely limited. They don't appear to follow ordinary intersubjective uh, perception, such as they do in the Gospels. And um, Jesus does not appear repeatedly. Okay, I mean, there's a later time when Paul says that he he had a vision of Jesus. That when he actually calls a vision. But it's not this, you know, repeated appearances within this short period of time like we get with Jesus, like he's appearing to Mary Magdalene in the morning and the disciples in the evening and so forth. This is this is this extremely uh, strong initiating event that the Apostle Paul has. Also, the bright light is unique. There's no bright light in the Gospels, which is kind of interesting. There's a, a hymn that says something about uh, appearing in rays of resurrection light. Um, and it's, it's not true. Jesus didn't appear to the disciples in rays of resurrection light. He's just there. And there's no indication of a bright light at all. It's a more ordinary kind of appearance. So there's all these kind of ways in which it's, it's more like a visionary appearance. If we then make the conversion of Paul kind of our paradigm, like, well, since, you know, we have the epistles of Paul, we have an eyewitness account there, and we make that our, our best eyewitness account, like our prize example. What that's going to do is it's going to de-emphasize the ways in which the gospel accounts are actually better as eyewitness accounts of the resurrection. And I thought it was interesting because Dr. Lacona has uh, argued for Johannine authorship of the Gospel of John and seems to accept Matthew and authorship of the Gospel of Matthew. So even aside from Luke and Mark, where we might say, well, they were written by non-eyewitnesses, Matthew and John should be eyewitness accounts of the resurrection if you accept traditional authorship. So I thought it was interesting that he appeared prepared to grant that those aren't, and then said, except for Paul, you know, but you're not going to get as much out of, of Paul, especially not as far as the rationality of the disciples' belief in the resurrection. So we should avoid that Gilbert and Sullivan effect where we say, Paul, ta-da, because we have his own epistles and so forth. And we have a, and then in, in Acts, we have what purport to be transcripts or some kind of a, a reports of what he actually said happened to him. Yay, now we've got an eyewitness account. And then we ignore the fact that it, it doesn't look like an account of a physically resurrected person in the same way. Now, it's been uh, interesting to me that I've encountered a fair bit of resistance to the idea that this was a vision. And there's a lot of debate out there about that. Some people seem to think it's very important to argue that this was not a vision that, that you really could have hit Jesus with a rock if you'd thrown it up above the Damascus Road. Um, some of these, I think, are more committed to the sort of minimal or core facts approach, and that's the reason. Others, I think, are trying to defend Paul's apostleship, so they have a countervailing theological consideration that uh, Paul could not have been, in their opinion, a real apostle if he was not within, in a sense, you know, tangible physical contact with Jesus. I'm not convinced that that meaning of saw or sight of the resurrected Jesus 
is a necessary condition for apostleship. Paul himself recognized that his apostleship was a little unusual, and he was, I think, a bit defensive about that. Um, but if that if that appearance of Jesus was veridical and Jesus really said, you know, I'm sending you to the Gentiles, I think we need to accept that Jesus knew what he was doing and that, again, theologically, that Jesus chose Paul, he selected Paul, and he mightily used Paul. And so, you know, if he was appearing to him in a visionary form um, and Paul couldn't have actually touched him, then that was good enough for the purpose. I think... I tend to think that if if it were so important that he appeared to Paul in a physical fashion, he would have taken more trouble to make it physical. He would have been like walking on the road and everybody would have been able to see him and Paul would have he would have invited Paul to touch him or something if that was that important. But if that is you, if you're saying no, you know, he had to be physically present or Paul could not really be an apostle. Here's what I would just encourage you to do. I would encourage you epistemologically not to make the argument for the resurrection turn on that. So you have a separate theological reason why you believe that, but I think you should acknowledge that we don't actually have direct evidence, strong evidence that Jesus was physically present as far as the actual details of the experience. And therefore, um, I would still encourage you to distinguish the evidential aspects of Paul's experience from the evidential aspects of the apostles' experience while here on earth. Because even if we say counterfactually that Jesus could have been touched on that occasion, he wasn't, as far as we can tell, touched. Or, um, you know, he wasn't handing anything to Paul or Paul handing anything to him and so forth. So that was never tested. So epistemologically, your argument for the resurrection should not turn on that. And that I think you can accept even if you consider it important for some other theological reason that Jesus was physically present on that occasion. That's the kind of thing I want to try to do when I, I try to make the strongest argument for the resurrection. I don't want to neglect the conversion of Paul. I do think it has force and an important part of our cumulative case. But I also want to be very precise about how we should use that force. Thanks for watching.